And uh, our goals are to promote hope, uh, wellness, uh, both getting well and staying well and sustained recovery. So today we talk to Gary Ray, a team leader of a mental health organisation that unashamedly promotes all those goals. And I'll just repeat them again. Hope. Uh, wellness, uh, both getting well and staying well. And that's a challenge, isn't it? We can get well, but staying well is often uh, and something that takes a lot of discipline and, and, and uh, effort and sustained recovery. So the organisation that Gary uh, works for is uh, RI International. Uh, It has a focus on recovery education opportunities. So here's Gary to talk about that focus. But uh, let's uh, first let's uh, ask about his personal journey, which has led him to head up an American-based organisation in the heart of uh, Manukau. And uh, I think, uh, Gary, when that uh, American organisation started to pitch for contracts in New Zealand, that uh, threw a bit of a frightener through some of the existing NGOs that uh, no lo- you know, not only were they competing amongst themselves, all Kiwis together, but then the, there was a, the introduction of... Um, what was called Recovery Innovations, I think. Yeah. Good afternoon, uh, listeners. Yes, indeed. Um, uh, Quite a while ago, uh, in actual fact, the the CMDHB, the County's Manukau uh, Health, went overseas to actually look for a a wellness model, something they could bring back and utilise for the uh, mental health and drug addiction services here in uh, South Auckland. So they were leading the way in searching uh, for the... um, you know, the uh, fence at the top of the hill instead of the ambulance at the bottom. Uh, yeah. And from that day on, it's just been nothing but amazing uh, happenings in the in the way of mental health and addiction services. It's brilliant. So give us a little bit of a history of that, because I do recall when recovery, it was called Recovery Innovations, uh, and nobody seemed to know too much much about them. But as you say, Counties Manukau District Health Board went offshore, and I think w- a framework was involved with a program, a consumer-driven uh, organisation, the setting up of a consumer-driven organisation. And some of that was also influenced by um, an American organisation. I don't think it was Recovery Innovations, um, but yeah. So Meta was uh, the organisation way back when uh, the CMDHB sent a team over to, to look at the recovery models and um, and they brought uh, back then Recovery Innovations back to New Zealand to to train up their, their teams. Um, but also in, in connecting to a, a office or a wellness centre where, where people can come and work on their wellness and work on their addiction uh, education. Um, and that, that is where initially the training started, um, to use the, the, the RAP, the Wellness Recovery Action Plan. Um, and each and every one of us that connect to RI International, formerly known as uh, Recovery Innovations, um, that's, that's a great starting point. The RAP, uh, the Wellness Recovery Action Planning, though, was already here in New Zealand, I think, wasn't it? Or or was it uh, bought here by uh, uh, RI International or Recovery Innovations? That's right, yep. uh, Once the uh, DHB team were trained and and brought back, uh, of course, they had some other training in in likes of peer employment training um, where individuals uh, uh, get the knowledge to work in this industry. Right. And what that does create in the, the peer employment training is a, a, a niche market for our, our own lived experience culture to to grow and and learn more. So is that uh, where New Zealand developed this uh, growth industry of of peer uh, peer counselling and peer employ? Well, not so much peer employment, but peer counselling, peer to peer, because Counties Manukau is very strong on it, isn't it? They've, they've got a staff of, I've, I believe, somewhere between 30 or 40 or maybe maybe more. Um, they have indeed, and that's, uh, from what I understand, that's about to grow once they open up their new uh, Te Ahumai unit uh, sometime in 2018. Um, and from what I understand, they may have near on 10 peer uh, individuals on staff there. Uh, so that 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 culture and that industry is growing every single day. 
Right, so T.O., my, uh, we take it from us, would very much like to bring some detail about the new T.O. My because it's a whole new building. I think there's going to be uh, greater spaces uh, in this acute uh, unit. So um, I've been talking to the uh, peer uh, the peer leader, I guess, at uh, counties uh, to see whether uh, take it from us can get somebody to interview. But mm-hmm. you're saying that within this acute psychiatric unit, uh, Gary, there could be 10 peer, uh, w- what do we call them, uh, peer counsellors? Uh, peer support specialist is our certification. Yeah. Uh, and, and that's an amazing title. Uh, and the reason being it's exciting is because a lot of the organisations out there, NGOs that, that employ uh, teams to connect to mental health and addictions, part of their certification is the peer employment training. Uh, and of course, what comes with the uh, peer employment training is lived experience. Right, so that's the big distinction, isn't it, between uh, community support workers and peer support specialists is that uh, community support workers don't always have lived experience of mental health. And and it does surprise me that uh, there's a large group of community support workers who are operating with people with lived experience and they don't necessarily have uh, the same... They, they don't have maybe... An, well, they have an empathy, I'm sure, uh, but they don't have that lived experience. They, they don't uh, have the experience of perhaps spending time in an acute psychiatric unit uh, or in respite or, or living daily with a mental health which uh, can be pretty dark at times. It can be dark indeed. Uh, and I would say on average in, in the, the, the amount of years that I've been part of this wonderful uh, culture uh, and leading the team here in New Zealand is that when I get often a chance to talk to people, they either have one or the other, mental health or uh, addiction. Um, but again, there are, there are, like myself, I have not only mental health at the age of 17 and diagnosed at 19, but I came with unfortunately co-occurring addiction. Um, which crept up on me and it was quite debilitating. But the people I generally talk to that doesn't have one or the other, at some stage in life, there has been something tragically happened. Uh, Whether it be the loss of a loved one, um, it's still trauma. Well, I've had the, uh, the privilege of being the speaker at your... Uh, peer employment training graduations and I guess uh, I've had my eyes opened at the trauma that so many of the people who come to uh, RI International uh, the trauma of both addiction and mental health and they're really looking for a new direction in their lives and that peer employment training is, is I think it does provide a new direction it does indeed. Um, and I come from lived experience of that. Um, when I did my, my wellness recovery action plan, it allowed me to put things in place like tools that were unique to me. Um, but I can't forget, you know, the support of a lovely wife um, and, and a very caring person that supported me. In the past years, I've always hidden my psychiatric uh, uh, diagnosis uh, for fear of being judged or, or you know, not getting that job and so on. But what, what Recovery Innovations helped me to do was actually stand up and be counted as, as a human being uh, with lived experience uh, that, that has meaning and purpose in life. And when I did my peer employment training, that was hugely evident. Three quarters of the way through my uh, peer employment training, I had this amazing epiphany. And, and it hit me like, like a, a shock that everything that happened in my life, all the darkness, the bad stuff, the, the, the really hard stuff, oh, and the good, all went to make me who I am right here today. And that just, uh, all the baggage just, just fell away. It's amazing. So can I I just clarify here, so so you were introduced to uh, RI International as a client. Correct. So so you you somehow heard about them, Uh, you did a wellness recovery action plan, which you say is designed specifically and personally for you and your recovery, and then you went on and did a peer employment training. When did you 
when did you reap uh, the benefits of all that and become an employee of uh, Recovery International? Well, that had a turn a really, really interesting turn of events. Uh, obviously, my, my journey started out with my doctor, which sent me to CADS, which is a, a, a drug and alcohol uh, kind of rehabilitation facility. Um, then CADS sent me to uh, Recovery and Innovations, as it was known back then. Um, while doing my rap in the rap class, this gentleman that sat across the table, which was called a facilitator, really inspired me with him sharing his journey and, and where he'd come from and and allowed me to look at tools that were just so right for me. Obviously, my toolbox doesn't work for everybody else because we all, we're all totally different and quite unique. I was encouraged to go on to do PET because I wanted to do what that facilitator was doing. Um, so that, that's your peer employment training. Correct. Yeah. Correct. Uh, so once once in PET, I realised that that I have the experience that that I can connect to other people, and what that does is create or take part in an amazing recovery culture here in New Zealand. And I felt as though I belonged. I belonged to something, something that was intrinsically me, but connected to so many other beautiful people in their wellness. And the, uh, the the team leader, as it was back then in uh, Recovery Innovations, he came across to me and says, you know, I'd like you to, once you finish your PET, I'd like you to come over and, and have an interview. And I was thinking to myself, if he knew all the stuff I'd done in my life, that I'd never get to the second stage. <laughs> and funny enough, um, he shared with me that the reason he came across was because of my history. Uh, and obviously, in the past, certain jobs haven't been gotten because of that, you know, jail experience um, for whatever reason. But because RI were looking at at the, the the correction system, part of going in there and sitting with with people that are on probation um, uh, serve, or looking at prison sentences was a person that they needed to come from lived experience, and that to me was was that's what I wanted to do. In that case, that was lived experience of being inside. Correct. So, Absolutely. So you bought uh, lived experience of being inside as well as lived experience of addiction and mental health. Correct. Okay, just while we you mentioned addiction and, and mental health, have you got any insights as to what came first? I mean, did your mental health sort of erupt, if you like, or be manifest itself and then was uh, got worse because of your addiction or, or, or what, what was the connection? Well, my obviously, you know, for quite a number of years, my mental health got in the way of many, many things and it, and it got in the way of life. Um, you know, being a medicated adult most of my life, it got in the way of my relationships. Uh, you know, being a young fella and, and, you know, contemplating dating was not a, a, a welcome thing because of the, you know, you have to hide of a medicated adult, you know. Um, Doesn't get you to the second date when you, uh, if you admit that on the first. Unfortunately, no. And sadly, I hid that um, in my relationships for many, many years. Um, and why I connected to my lovely wife this morning, and thank you, Karat, for, for, for being me there and supporting me. I came clean with my lovely wife, and, and she basically said, is that all? Oh, wow. Of course... Uh, that was a pleasant surprise. Absolutely. I was just quite amazed. But it was the recovery culture that allowed me to come out of the closet. So that's one of the great luxuries of working in mental health, isn't it? It is. That we we hope that the people we're uh, working with and and working for and that sort of thing will understand that there won't be any of that uh, stigma and discrimination or judgment. I mean, it doesn't always happen, unfortunately, in mental health, but it sounds as though you've got a culture at uh, RI International where there is an empathy towards it and probably all of your the people you're working with, I'm not talking clients, but your staff, are people who have lived experience of either mental health or addictions. Each and every one of our team come from lived experience. It's, it's, that's the beautiful way of being peer. We're a peer-led service, which means not one of our team actually don't 
or can't connect to mental health or addictions. Right. Um, and it's been said as, uh, and we call people that come to our service guests. It's my job to serve my fellow team members uh, as well as the guests that come through our doors. And they've likened it actually coming in our doors and feeling the love. Uh, that's an incredible feeling. Well, that's a wonderful term, guests. I, I really like that because uh, the mental health uh, industry uh, can't decide what to call people with lived yeah. experience. We're talking to uh, Gary Ray, the team leader of a mental health organisation called RI International. It was formerly known as Recovery Innovations. You've had, uh, well, some troubled waters. Uh, and I did ask you earlier about uh, the sort of link between mental health and addictions. Uh, you know, it's something that uh, I've always wondered about is what comes first. It's a bit of a chicken and egg situation, but I guess uh, where we have that sort of dual diagnosis, uh, it's, it's, it's tough going. It is tough, um, and, it, and it is a question of which comes first, chicken or the egg. Uh, but in my case, unfortunately, uh, mental health was the foundation for that furthered the rest of my, uh, well, bridge-burning uh, experiences throughout my life. Um, unfortunately, often when that happens, we, have a, uh, we can have a co-occurring addiction, uh, which means mental health comes with its own addiction processes. Oh, so you, you feel that the mental health could encourage, could could be part of an addictive personality? Is that what you're saying? What I'm saying is that, that sometimes with mental health, uh, co-occurring addiction is, is quite prevalent. Um, but obviously, you know, it, it's not always the, the case. In my case, um, you know, I'd spent up uh, many of my life with a father that drank alcohol on, on a huge copious amount. Um, and, and I lived with that and was put off alcohol for many, many years. And, and it wasn't until um, a, a previous wife and I uh, had a, a parenting plan or a, a uh, parenting group to, to get educated on how to come together and work with our, our children. Um, and, and one of the... the the, the wonderful kind of snippets that were told were, you know, if you and your wife want to talk together or you and your husband want to talk together, go have a glass of wine. Keep the kids out of the lounge and, and just have a glass of wine and, and chat and talk. Um, and unfortunately, that led to uh, a, a glass of wine a night, two nights, three nights, until it became a bottle a night. Uh, and, and that's how something that, that, that um, can creep up on you. So she didn't really... Uh, pay you a favour, did she? And that, I, I find that a little bit of advice quite staggering in that uh, I've always uh, been led to believe that you need to be sober if you're going to have, um, you know, se sensible and serious discussions with your partner. Uh, but alcohol isn't exactly the, the, the way to uh, uh, create a sensible conversation. Unfortunately, when the alcohol doesn't stop, it, you know, it, it, you have to get more than relaxed. Uh, it, it can create absolute problems. And I, I, I do understand that may not have been the, you know, the crux of it. But, um, and that's why I connect to peer support, being, being peer with people. You know, we connect to not using those, those uh, extremities of, of alcohol to be able to come outside our shell. And, and, and yeah. that's why it's so important to actually look at addiction as, as an addiction. Uh, so, you know, I guess uh, for those people with a vulnerability to mental health, um, you know, alcohol is never going to be a wellness tool, is it? No, unfortunately not. Um, and the, the, other, the other side of uh, the addiction process, uh, which I guess it came after my mental health, there's no matter where you go, you can't get away from it. I spent almost a year uh, finding an alternative place to drive past the dairy that doesn't have a bottle store, or uh, leaving the shopping up to my, you know, uh, leaving my shopping up to Karat, my, my wife, because they plant the bottle shop right in the dead smack in the front of the, the supermarket. Tell us a little bit about the program at uh, RI International that has this focus on wellness. Well, the, uh, you're talking about the uh, my personal wellness plan. Um, oh, well, I'd be very interested to hear what's in your wellness toolbox. I think that would be very helpful. So my wellness toolbox, I have tools that, that keep me safe every single day, and I have a wrap for work. I have a wrap for home. 
um, and obviously I have a rap for my my own wellness. And, and when I unfortunately, well, fortunately, I won't be going back there. Uh, so it's quite important that that toolbox is, is geared up to serve me every single day. Part of that is is recognizing the triggers that that I may go through, a bit of pressure at, at, at work or a bit of pressure at home. I realize that that's starting to affect me, and I can uh, you know utilize my tools uh, to or daily maintenance to to get move away from that. So, so what are some of those things that you do every day um, that sort of well not necessarily guarantee but um, secure your wellness? Uh, for me, it's self care. Self care is a, a really huge thing because part of my wellness is that you know I, I love and care about myself, uh, and I love and care about uh, my family that, that are really closely connected to me, and making sure that they're they're well and provided for is a huge part of my wellness, and of course I, I feel a, a million bucks when I when I connect to that. Um, my my son Liam, he, he just he's a, a guiding light in my life and is a huge tool. Uh, that keeps me on the straight and narrow. Uh, so you've got a you've got a lot of incentives there to yeah. to stay well and uh, remain, uh, you know, uh, uh, the Gary Ray that's effective and uh, and contributing. And that's part of being the the example, or, or I am the evidence that wellness is totally possible. Um, I have on my my card uh, ITE. Uh, I don't have a degree. Uh, I don't have a PhD. But I ITE. I am the evidence that, that <laughs> I am the evidence. Yep. Really. Uh, and that's my credentials all through my life. Right. I've spent uh, fifty five years getting those credentials. Brilliant. Uh, and being that example to not only my fellow team members, um, but the guests that come through my door uh, or, or RI International's door uh, is a huge, huge standing. Uh, and, and obviously, if uh, I'm doing it, anybody else can. So this gives you a great deal of credibility that you can say that you've been there, you've, you know about addiction, you know about mental health vulnerability, uh, and here you are, team leader of a US-based uh, uh, recovery RI international. Very much so. Yeah, and I, I'm in a really, really great space to, be, to see people grow, not only in our team, but the people that come through our doors, they go to our classes, um, they connect to us every single day, um, and, and they can connect to us half hour before, half hour after to talk about um, anything that, that they need to connect to. Mm-hmm. We're not counsellors. We're, we're not uh, marriage guidance counsellors or, or psych uh, you know, doctors, but we're peers driving it. They're, they're driving the car. They're, they're, they're moving in their own direction. So we're not actually doing it for them. We're, we're providing the information. Uh, we know of the services out there so they can actually, yeah, take ownership and do it themselves. Right. So, uh, you know, that raises the whole issue of people who try and control others with mental health vulnerabilities. And I, I think control is one of the most unhelpful uh, tools towards recovery. And it sounds as though you're giving these people the independence to make their own choices and uh, get on the journey. And I like the fact that you brought in the choice process. We had a, a, a wonderful guest come to our services that um, unfortunately um, you know, was looking at self-harming. With her permission, we, we connected her to the service that, that she wanted to take part in and the, we ended up calling the, the, the police service and... Uh, in a short time after, they, they sent along two constables, uh, two male constables. As soon as they came into my office, they they turned to peer. They were supporting the guests. They were validating her strengths. And you could just see the, the beaming smile on her face. It was incredible to see these two men um, have this add-on to their normal duties. And I must say, uh, you know, congratulations to the two constables. You know who you are. Um, that, that was great service to a, to a wonderful guest that was in a fragile state. So what was the outcome there? Uh, they took her to the service that she wanted to uh, tap into? Funny enough, because of a RAP program, she has a, uh, a care plan. Uh, and the constables acknowledged her care plan and, and actually, uh, you know, connected to a to complement the fact that she had all this written down and knew where she wanted to go. So this uh, one of the constables went down, brought the car up to the back of the mall, uh, 
uh, and the constable actually, uh, you know, took the guest away to where she wanted to go. Wow. Um, but not having to go through the mall with a uniformed police officer. Right, right. So that was just total care on that person. Uh, yeah, and, and, that's a lovely story.